reasons why it's important when we um, make these comparisons with the so-called European Jews, because they're working in our template, in the template that we were supposed to, and only in certain limited um, historical contexts have we even work within that Bible and biblical template. And whenever we see our folks, our people working in that biblical or Bible template, historically, because there's many um, black preachers, real preachers of the past, who immediately, once they were able to read and, and the Holy Spirit guide them and they, and they looked at the Bible and they looked at the experience of so-called Negro and black folks, is they made the connection. They made the very same connection that ones like um, Rudolph R. Windsor made, you know, in, in, in the, valley, the Valley of the Dry Bones. You understand the conditions that face black people in America. But a lot of black people, they're afraid or really rebellious. You understand? That's what the Lord says. The Lord says, my people are peculiar people. You know, he says, my people are peculiar people. What does he mean by that? Any other people would gladly and would have made this connection already. You understand that, you know, this connection being evident and being real, but black folks don't want to deal with it. So we looked at that Viola Davis, the maid thing, you know, because now they're hoping to win for a maid thing even though the last time, or before the last time, no, the first time, actually, um, any black uh, woman won, like, a maid kind of uh, Oscar was for a maid role. I think that's the Gone with the Wind, the one, the, the, the maid, the black maid in the Gone with the Wind. Now we have a movie called The Help, because that's exactly, they want, they're trying to return black people to their, their, their position, especially the black woman is very important because how to make a slave, Slick Willie Lynchism says it, says it very, very plainly, says that the black woman is, is the key, is vital for our, our um, economy. This is why with the feminist movement, the whole feminist movement connection, the feminist movement of which was white supremacy used their daughters, their wives, to infiltrate and to stop the black power movement with the rise of the feminist movement. And the feminist movement is keeping that tradition alive. So what they have to do, they have to force the, this division between the black male and the black female. You understand? And to busybody themselves in the black people situation and make the black people dependent on white so-called intellectuals and, and social scientists and others to solve black people's situation. So when black folks write books like this or like even um, the ISIS papers, Francis Cress Welsing's book, and have researched these, these topic matters and present all the evidence, the majority of black folks and the so-called smart ones, the ones that have gone to school and university, they, they turn a deaf ear to it. But then when the white people now read these same books, this is interesting, when white folks read these same books, and then regurgitate and paraphrase and rephrase what our own intellectuals, our own black folks have, have written and have researched and presented for us 50 or 100 years earlier or a long time earlier, then black people are willing to accept it. What should happen to such a people? Do such a people deserve to be free? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it should be very clear what the answer is to that. So we have the maid, the help, you know. So they have to keep the black people by keeping the black woman. This is where the black woman, we always talk about what's the role of, of, of the black woman and giving the black woman her due. And in truth, there's a very true point to that. But it really begins with the black woman. You know, it can't really begin with the black man, because black man may know it's true. You know what I mean? And black men may know it. Some black men may know it's true. But it's only until or when the black woman themselves start to recognize that truth. And this is, 
this is where the struggle, you know, this is where the whole struggle is right now. This is this is exactly, you know, where the struggle is right now um, concerning our so-called, you know, our so-called, uh, our so-called people. But, um, so Yotor, does Yotor tell us anything? Does, does Jethro tell us anything? Yeah, Jethro tells us that we have to, we have to get our house in order. And, and it, it speaks to the brotherhood. This is why I said this was a brotherhood point. And, um, it's interesting because when we posted the, the first part of this brotherhood, the four parts of previous four parts and it's important to to look at those four parts of 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 um the RSS number 17 four parts also we want to announce right here um is for the disciples discipleship we're still in this particular semester right here we're at 17 of about 54 52 portions and um and for for the disciples decam is more decam is more that is i think it's very key and very important um, to have a, a good understanding from Berasit or Bereshit, which is the first, you understand, all the way to the, the Berakot or to the 54th portion, to have a good comprehension of our story. But the first thing that most of our people need is to know, well, who they are. You understand who we are, who we are as a as a people, and this is why, once again, we suggest um, this particular book from Babylon to Timbuktu, because it gives us some of the historical context, you know, how we got over here, how we came from over there, over here. It gives the pre, the pre-slavery, you know, this is Black History Month. Um, this is called Black History Month, and these are aspects of black history. In fact, we might just post this for black history. Um, uh, NAACP, Niggas, Apes, Alligators, Coons, and Possums, oh, no, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. See how they view, still view us. I heard this Negro act, actress, um, Viola Davis, she even said on the CBS Morning Show, she said, as a colored woman, not as an African woman, not as an African woman in America, or not as, a, as an American woman of African descent or anything, but as a colored woman. Wow. But I guess she's, she's a part of that particular organization that was founded by folks that hope to keep us away from our true blessing. You understand? It was founded by certain Jews. In other words, the NAACP was founded by Jews. And now, man, the Jews know this history. They've tried to debunk it but they really can't. So the only other thing to do is to support the black movement and try and that support of the black movement to try to keep them away from certain things. You know, keep certain things off of the, you know, for, off the front lines from front and center. And much of it is our true history pre-slavery and looking at slavery in its proper historical context. So for Black History Month, we're going to do something a little special right here. We're going to do something a little special right here. And we have a couple of lectures to really present in this particular time. So um, hopefully we'll also be able to have this available. We also want to see the other brothers and sisters if ones are able to download these things and put them in their fuller context on you know, uh, CDs or DVDs and, and share them if ones find that these teachings are important um, to disseminate and circulate for, for, for reasonable, you know, for reasonable um, prices or reasonable exchanges, you know, please do. And we want to just give, give a permission, you understand, basically on that to keep this, as it matches, by any means necessary, you know, by any means necessary to feel free to disseminate this and put the teachings in their context. That's the main thing we ask because, for example, this is this is going to be a special part for Black History Month because there's, there's, there's a bunch of nigger shit. You know, there's a lot of nigger shit out there, but it's not really talking about our history as this particular once lost but now found Beta Israel as we, as um, black Hebrews or black Jews or more um, 
correctly as Ethiopian Hebrews and elect Ras Tafari. So while we still have a little bit of this, we're roughly past the, the, the midway point of this month since this month of February 2012 is, well, February, all Februarys are the shortest month. So this is what they give for, for um, black so-called black history. It's like a joke, basically. But um, let's make the joke on them. Yeah? So let's utilize this particular month to put this particular teaching. We're going to touch on a couple of basic books and things to read for black history. So let's call this black, black history, right? Black History Month 2012. Now, I know a lot of you are probably still weeping and mourning and, you know, um, uh, Whitney Houston, Whitney, Whitney, Whitney. But Whitney and Bobby and, you know, I thought about this much. And in a sense, some, you know, when you meditate on something and, 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 and you, you want to say it, but you, in a sense, don't want to say it because it might offend some folks, that's the truth right there. You see, that's, that's how you know when you you found the truth. Why don't you want to offend certain people? Because, you know, you don't really want to offend some people, off-end them. You know, they're going to be a little off-ended. But Whitney and Bobby, they're like the, that guy in the Matrix, at least Whitney, I would say. Bobby still, you know, with his life, there's hope. So we can still hope, you understand? But the decisions people make are the decisions people make. Um... They found Zion. They found a, 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 a manifestation of Zion. You know, like in the movie Zion, remember the Matrix movie, which was written by actually a black woman, and there was the, the seminal ideas. And this is, should be discussed Black History Month, that Black History Month, I mean, look at the inventors. I think on Wendy Williams' show, she had, I didn't see it myself, but I and I sister wife told me that, uh, um, I think it was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar uh, Abu, uh, Abdul was on there. I think he's publishing a book on, on black inventors or something. I mean, we already, a lot of us already know that a lot of inventions from the street light to the, to the, to the light itself, really, if the truth must be, must be told to the, to some of the ground plans for D.C., to the refrigerator, to all sort of things. I mean, people know about um, some people. Most people probably will say um, um, uh, George uh, Washington Carver, um, you know, with the, with, with the, the, the peanut, you know what I mean, you know, with, and the cotton, the cotton gin. You know, we thought those inventions, and most of those people invented those inventions to make our enslavement a little easier, but Masa only used those inventions to profit himself, basically. That's the reason why he invented the whole thing with the cotton gin, you know, to separate, you know, to separate the, 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 the cotton, you know, from that little, like, kernel, that seed, and, you know, to, to pick cotton so that, Blacks wouldn't be cotton picking niggas. But instead, Master said, Wow, I can make a lot of money and make these niggas do something else. See, we thought, Oh, we would have some free time if we find a way to get that done, and Master will go a little bit easy on us. But that's not how it happened. It didn't really happen like that. But yet, and still, they say necessity is the mother of invention. And that's a pretty good statement. Um, uh, and Aswad's song, um, Aswad, the reggae group out of England, um, the song, the album they worked on with uh, uh, Bob Marley, um, one of the first albums, that was part of the tune, um, Necessity was the Mother of Invention, um, you know, using what they had, and there was like plenty in Mama Africa, something to have affected the lyric, but Necessity was the Mother of Invention. So because of our desperate situations, you understand, from Babylon to Timbuktu to the West, to the Amenta, you understand, to fulfill 
Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 to 68. Pay careful attention to verse 68. So we, where will we begin with black history? Where should we begin with black history in this Black History Month? Well, let's begin... Let's begin from the beginning. Let's begin from this book that most of y'all should know, the Bible. But most of y'all only are familiar with the Bible. You know like that, well, there's the Bible. That's the Bible. But what really it contains or what it really speaks to, most of y'all probably don't know the Bible. So let's begin our black history. And when we talk about black history, we're talking about the history that concerns us as black people in the Americas and the Caribbean, the so-called Negroes, uh, what we know as the lost sheep. I mean, in the sense that they're Negroes because they have lost their, their nationality. They've lost their nationhood. They do not know that they are Beta Israel. They do not know that their ethnicity is Ethiopian Hebrew. You understand? Or Hebraic, Ethiopic. They do not know this. So they are called niggers. You understand? They are called niggers. And niggers, according to the Bible, is the byword. You understand? Is the byword. So let's begin off with niggers. The first thing we need to begin off with is with nigger. Now we know nigger derived from Negro as a pejorative for you college folks, but as a, as a diss, we'll call it a diss. Street folks, you know, project Jews and Israelites, we say that's a diss. You college niggas, you understand, you'll call it a pejorative, right? So as a pejorative nigger. Now, of course, you know that we've turned this Negro nigger thing into a term of endearment. You know, it's a term of endearment, ain't it? Yeah, this term of endearment, let's do a slash here. We spell it a little different, right? We do it a little different. We call it nigga, my nigga. And then we add, to pluralize it or make it more than one, we add a Z sound and we say niggas, niggas. So Black History Month must begin from niggas. You understand? It must begin with this word. Now, some Negroes have wanted to outlaw this word nigger in either form, nigga or in nigger. They want to outlaw this particular word. Now, a lot of those niggers belong to organization that prefers we be called colored people, that we be called colored people. And that organization, you know, is the NAACP. Now, the NAACP was not founded or directed by black people. That means someone else was trying to redirect us. It's like in a court case, you know, where the prosecutor and the defense, and they say, uh, I like to redirect. You understand? So they jumped up into our movement, and they said, we like to redirect, you know, but they kept black folks as the front people. Because when you go back to even um, planned um, genocide, I mean, Planned Parenthood, you understand? When you go to Planned Parenthood, that organization founded by, like, Mary Sangers or Sangers, right? She basically was a racist. She was a white supremacist. She was a eugenicist. You understand? The, the feminist movement regards her as a champion. And a lot of um, dumb nigger bitches, females, you understand, who have other issues, you understand, other traumatic sort of issues with black men and the males and so forth and so on, they are used as the attack dogs, you understand, of the white women who are running this feminist operation on behalf as a subsidiary of white supremacy. That's a subsidiary of white supremacy, you know, um, the feminist movement and everything. Because it's not black women really looking at their situation with a knowledge of who they are, deciding what they need to do. No, it's them on the leash. You know, it's like they're, they're like pets for these um, white racist bitches, white racist females. I mean, you know, some may find it offensive because it's true. 
You see, it's not that they can't really demonstrate with facts or, or, or evidence that it's not true. And they will try to hoodwink and bamboozle you and torture you in various different ways. You know, they'll try to torture you, you understand, into be believing something a little bit differently. You know, but that's the truth, and there's a lot of other evidence. A lot of other folks have actually gone into these particular subject matters that we just kind of briefly reference so we can get a context. You see, because if we don't have it in context, all we're dealing with is nonsense. So we need to put these matters into better context. So let's once again begin with the nigger, negro, niggers. Mm-hmm. So this is Black History Month, you know. So what I want to do is, are there, are there any niggers in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Are there niggers in the Bible? This is what we want to know. We want to know, are there niggers in the Bible? Now, according to the Bible, we're going to look up in this concordance right here, right, to save a little bit of time. So this is a little old concordance right here. So we're going to look on the end. Let's look on the end, right? And let's find if there's any niggers. We want to know, are there any niggers in the Bible? So your preacher, what did, you, what did your preacher say? What did your pastor say? You've gone to church at all? A little bit? A lot? Have you ever heard nigger mentioned in church? Oh, nigger is a word we don't want to say. You understand? But we don't go to church and, and repent using the word nigger. You see, we don't say the word nigger in church. But when we turn to Acts of the Apostle, chapter 13, verse 1. Acts of the Apostle, chapter 13, verse 1. Now, for your background study, we'll, 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 we'll get into that. We'll, we'll put some verses up here for you as well. Let's go to 13 and 1 first. Let's go there quickly. 13 and 1, Acts of the Apostle. Because remember, this is... Black History Month, and it's the shortest month in the um, Western in the Western year. It's the shortest month in the in the Western calendar. Thirteen and one. It says right here. This is where Paul and Barnabas were called by the Holy Spirit by the um, uh, Ruach HaKodesh by the Mensis Kedus by the Holy Spirit. Now, verse one. There were in the church that was at Antioch or Antiochia certain prophets. There were certain Nevims, Nabims, or Nabiat, and there were teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called, that was called Niger. That's how they teach you to pronounce it. Like J E S U S is Jesus. But they teach you to say it as Jesus. So you will worship the compromise of Jah and Zeus that was done in the early church in order to get them to worship white supremacy or the Antichrist. That's where they was able to begin to whitewash, you understand, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, falsely called Jesus or Jesus. So we make that point because you've been taught to read. If you know how to read, you should be able to read. Now, reading is basically learning letters, learning sounds, and saying it. But there's a slick thing in English. English is a, is a weird language. It's a mutt language. It has a lot of different words from a lot of different places. And things are said, tomato, tomato. You know, there's the King's English, the Queen's English, and some Negroes are, you know, against Ebonics. You know, why? Because it's ebony, and ebony is, is a very, is the hardest wood. You see, white supremacy don't want you to be firm. They want you to be pliable, malleable. They want to be able to shape you into whatever image gives them pleasure. It's like when you go into some of those old classic um, homes, some of those rich folks' homes, right? They have these little dolls around. You know, and these little statues and in some of the paintings of these little, like, midget the dinkoch, you know, um, um, dwarfs, you know, these little black dwarfs. It's like in ancient Egypt, he was called Bess, known as Bess. But these little black midgets around, like little cupids, almost like stupids, little black stupids called cupids. And, you know, 
it was, just, it was just Valentine's Day. But most folks don't know that that St. Valentine's and St. Valentine's was an African saint. People don't understand. St. Valentine's was an African saint who was martyred, you understand, know, because of heterosexual love. See, people don't understand that. They don't really recognize it. It wasn't about love, 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 love. No. It was about, so the things that are going on today in Sodom, spiritual Sodom and Egypt were the same things that were going on yesterday. You see, but what they've been able to do is erase your historical memory. You understand? Or not even teach you it to begin with. So all you know is all you have been taught. And all you can figure out is based on what you have been taught. So you can only see limitly. You know what I mean? Only limitly within that, you know, within that framework. Because, like, if the light is out, you can't really see anything. If there's a little bit of flick of flame, you can see a little bit. As the light gets brighter, you can see more and more and more. That's as you learn more, as you become illuminated with the truth. But you have to begin by loving the truth. Loving the truth means you want to find out what is true, even if it hurts your immature feelings and emotions. You want to find out what is true. But most folks don't have that desire, you see, because they already have an investment in the unprofitable works of unrighteousness. And because they have this investment with that, you know, they've gotten rich of the things of khatiyat, of sin, of evil, you understand, of wickedness, you know, and because they have a substance abuse, a substance. Materialism is substance abuse. Now, that's an interesting subject matter, materialism, substance abuse. We can get into that a little bit more. Write that down, note that, even investigate it for yourself. You understand, until we come again on that particular point. Because we don't want to lose sight right here of nigger. We, we can't lose sight of that nigger. You understand? And that nigger is ourselves. So we've lost sight of ourselves. We've become ashamed to recognize, well, this is a part of our, oh, it makes me feel so. See, Negroes have to recognize that God gave you a left brain and a right brain for you to use all your brain. Not only your so-called right emotional, we black people are right brain people. We emotional. We like to feel it. God also gave you a left brain. You see, but the left brain aspect has, has been totally neglected and rejected and disrespected. It, it has been. Because when we look in our history, when we look at black people who did something, we only look at the ones who appeal to our right brain side. That, that's who the majority can easily uh, assimilate and, and, and appropriate. You know, saying those who appeal to our feelings, uh, immature and 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 um, yeah, our, our immature feelings and emotions, as it were. But let's let's get back to this nigga. So we have Simeon, Simon, Simeon, who was called Niger and and Lucius or Lucius of Serene. Remember Simon of Serene which is a place in North Africa, some say roughly around Libya, you understand, when it was black, I mean, when the blacks were native, not the Harabs or Arabs, of the Bedouins of today, and Manayan, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So that's the whole context of the sentence right there, but, but here's the main part that we are focusing on. There is this one who is called Niger. Niger. Let's put this up here. Niger. So they give us the spelling of this as N-I-G-E-R. Now, some folks out there will try to play a game on you. Now, what what is this game they're playing? You take this down for a moment. You know, try to play. They'll, they'll, they'll try to play a game on you. I'm trying to find this um this document. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be able to document this um to document this uh for you to give you to give you the evidence because what's in the name? Names are very very important. Names are very very important. So you have to find out what's in the name. 
Well, what is in what is in a name? What is in a name? What is in a name? Sorry about that, my people. Um, in the excitement to bring this lesson, there's a particular book that we we thought we had right here, one of our reference reference uh, books, um, the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. Uh, we'll try to we'll try to get that for you, just to because we know we we know what the meaning of this of this is, but um, we want to show you how to document it how to document this for yourself, you know what I'm saying, so that you can find the truth, so you can be able to find the truth for yourself. And there was a quote that we had wrote down here concerning concerning names as well, why, why names are important, because names, names are, the, are the matrix, in a sense. Names are the matrix that contain you know, what we are mining for, what we are digging for, what we are seeking, is, is, is in the name. And names have two aspects to them. Names have a, what is known as the etymological side. The etymological, from the breakdown of that word, etymological is a two-part word, etymos logos. Etymos means true, and logos means word, word, speech, log, logic, in a sense. Um, and then we have the connotation. Now, the connotation is how words are um, used at a particular time. It's like the colloquial or the dialectical or in a certain particular time. It's like, you know, um, even today, there are words that we use, even in this whole Facebook, Twitter, um, um, texting generation, you know, internet, so forth and so on, electronic, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, internet um, generation, you know, there's a, there's a different use, like LOL don't mean lol, it's, it's an acronym, but it takes on the idea of being a word, and this is how things can be connotated, you know, they can be shifted and twisted, you, even slang is a connotation, when, when one says something in slang, they're not saying it according always to the etymological meaning, but the implied meaning, or the interpreted meaning, you understand, or the superimposed meaning of a word. And there's plenty of examples of that, um, too many to even get into um, right here. So names are very, very important. So when we find this word um, Niger, really nigger, it's nigger actually, nigger, niger, nigger. It has a link with Africa, of course, because obviously, unless you are, are dead asleep, you're going to think about Nigeria. So when we look at this right here, Niger, the interesting link is we have Niger, and then Ya is here, Nigeria which we know is a place in, in Africa. Now, they tell us that Niger, you understand, or actually Neger, if we look at the Bamarinya, we have this right here, ne gay re or Neger, 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 Neger. That, that is it in this, in this Ethiopic, in the pure Amharic, Neger. So the sound is the same. So... Here they fool you taking the, the, the G sound and making it a J sound, you understand, know and twisting it a little bit because that's, this, is, this is modern English. Even the British laugh sometimes at how we across the pond, you know, speak English, you know, language. is different than the so-called Queen's English, which was the King's English. So you see how language can change in the way black folks speak English and spoke English, you know, we call it Ebonics, and they, they make a joke out of it, but 
language has been transforming. I mean, look how the Irish speak English. You know, look how different people in England, you know, in, in Britain, you know, the Cockney speak a particular way. And everybody speaks it differently. Nobody makes too much out of that. They kind of actually glory in that diversity. But when black people now also develop their own individualized dialogue, you have a lot of so-called niggas feeling ashamed of it. Why? Because they are trying to live up to the standards of white supremacy, but they can't live up to any standards because already they were created black. That means they're higher than the standards of white supremacy because they're in the image and after the likeness of the true and living God. So that means when a, when a, a lost nigger, a nigger tries that or attempts that, they try the impossible, and it can only end up in hell and destruction. And this is why we keep seeing these examples, even such as the Whitney Houston example and plenty of other, Don Cornelius, and plenty of other of these examples. You know, saying not just the celebrities, but also so-called ghetto people, you know, the, the, the rest of us. You understand, know, people that are not up in that so-called show business or, or whatever they want to call it, you know, um, the music industry. So you can see now this route. Now, Nigeria, if you look at where Nigeria is in Africa, if we had a map or could superimpose a map, and you can see where Nigeria is in Africa and where they say, that we were sold into slavery, you understand, and where the slave ships came for us, you can quite clearly see this, this, this uh, connection. And let's put this right here, least we forget. This is Acts, right, Acts 13 and 1. This is very important because it says that Simon was what? What does the Bible say? Simon that was called. He was called. You know what it means to call? Holla at me. You understand? He was called Nega. He was called Nega. And Nega, we'll simplify, even though we can't find the, the, the reference book right now, we'll simplify. He was called black. You understand? He was called black. He was called black. Now, remember, this is Latin. Niger or, or Niger, Niger is Latin. I, I, I understand that. Niger is called Latin. If you look at a lot of the names of ones and ones, you understand they had Latin or Roman names. But it's obvious that the Romans, when we go back to Latin, we really find that there's even a black root. And there's an interesting Oromo connection to that as well. Just thought you should know that, or Romo, Rome, you know, connection and everything. So even the European languages, when we dig deep enough into its root, we can find that black connection, which is also part of our extended history. But we're keeping this within Black History Month, you know, in the, in the context of Black History Month 2012. So we have the nigger, the Negro, niggers, we have biblically Niger or Niger. We have Nigeria or Nigeria, which is called Nigeria. So notice something here, too. You have not Negro. They don't say Negro. They say Negro. They don't say Niger. They say Nigger. They don't say, say Niger. They say Nigger. But now here, biblically, they would tell you it's not Nigger here. It's really Niger here. They will tell you that this is not Nigeria. It's really Nigeria. You understand? They don't say it's Nigeria. But then the root of this, which is biblical, you understand? Here's where the Ethiopic breaks the code or, or, or discloses the true code and reveals the code. It is Nega. Nega. The pronunciation is very specific. If they wanted this to be Niger or Niger or something, they, there's another Fidel. There's an app for that. There's a Fidel for that. But this Fidel says gay or Neger, 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 right? And this is Acts of the Apostle. We find that Simon, right? Simon was called black. Now, we say, are there any niggers in the Bible? Well, it's obviously that they call Simon nigger. Simon was called nigger. 
So this is a very important part of black history right here, that even this, this um, term of endearment, as many of the youth say today, they say, yeah, we, we say nigger, but we don't say nigger like nigger. You know what I'm saying? We say, you know, my nigger, this is like a term, it's like a love, it's like a term of endearment. So there's no in indication that Acts of the Apostle, chapter 13, verse 13, look at that, 13, verse 1, you know, that that was negatively, you know, said. Otherwise, there would be some indication of that. But that's obviously that, that was a term of endearment used. So for this first ever Black History Month, you know, um, lecture or perhaps even series of lecture, we find something very important that should be taught for black history and taught to our youths. And there's a lot of, if these were cascades, if this was the internet, you know, like right here, this presentation, the nigger or nigger would cascade. There'll be other references, other links, and there's a lot of that already out there on the internet. Under Negro, there'll be other links. These will be like drop downs, other links. They can be expanded on and even deepened, and you'll find a lot of correspondence and, and relevance to real life. You understand? So, you know, discover this for yourself. Now, once again, this book right here, uh, The Valley of the Dry Bones by Rudolph R. Windsor, is highly recommended. And you can go to our study page, www. I know I don't have to say that, but LOJ Society. Um, dot org and go to our studies page and when you go to the studies page you can download i think we have some of these that you can download for free or and or you can go to our books page and you can order a copy or you know look for it on the internet and, and it's out there you know but these are some very important um reference works these particular two these are foundation these are crucial because it's impossible to receive the fullness. Remember what Christ said? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So if we don't know the truth, if we say, oh, that's not that important, then that means we're not going to know it. And then if we say, why aren't we free? Why there's no justice? Why there's no peace? Because you, you're ignorant. You, you, you're ignorant. You, you're stupid. You don't know. Because you don't know the truth. That's why you're not free of all this stuff that's holding you down and making life miserable and making living not really living because we are ignorant and we don't know the truth. So education is the key. You understand? And education doesn't just take place in the classroom, His Imperial Majesty says, our Godfather and King of Kings. So we have the Niger nigger, Negro connection black. Very simple. You understand? Very elegant to the point. But now where does the nigger come to America? You know, because we are American. Yeah, African American. You know, now later on, of course, Africa comes into that equation. But when we came over here, they didn't really call us Africans. You understand? They call us nigger. So here's the biblical link for it right here. So when does a nigger come to America? It is interesting because if we turn our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15. Let's put this up here. Let's document this. We have Deuteronomy 28, verses 15, right? Verses 15 to 68. 68. All right? That's, that's the references right there. Um, that's the documentation of it right there. What, we, what do we have here? We have the conditions that will bring chastise and this is the 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 the, the sub um um the the editor of this Schofield Bible um put in this kind of subtext here the conditions that will bring chastisement in the land but actually moreover these are the conditions this is what this book by Rudolf R Windsor goes into much more much more details of um, starting with like 1860, you know, roughly starting with us coming over here. This book shows our background history from Babylon, from, from ancient, uh, you know, ancient Palestine, ancient Arabia, ancient Egypt, you know, that whole biblical story 
and then after 70 AD, what happened to us, how we were scattered to the four winds of the earth, how we were scattered all over the place um, from Babylon to Timbuktu, then from Timbuktu and from West Africa and the West African kingdoms, you understand, we were brought in the chains of uh, shackles of slavery across the Trans-Ethiopic Ocean, which now they call it the Trans-Atlantic, but that ocean was called the Ethiopic Ocean. And then there's a sub, there's a sub um, text under that that actually explains the Ethiopian connection. You know, what's the, what's the significance of Ethiopia and the Ethiopian connection with us as African Americans and as blacks in the Americas and the Caribbean. Um, so this book goes into a little more, much more detail. And just to give you a little, a little, a little hint of this, because this kind of summarizes, in a sense, this chapter while giving certain actual evidence, you understand, to, to back up that this is a biblical prophecy that is fulfilled perfectly and shockingly, you understand, and even tragically, it is fulfilled in black history. You see, so, so th this is the root, uh, actually, of black history. And this is what, if we were, if we were rightly orientated and not in a disorientation, but if we, were, if we were rightly orientated as a people, if we were looking to the East, as it were, you know, and to the King of Kings and his Christ, this would be something that would be taught. And if it was taught to our children, and if we did spend even Black History Month in, 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 in dealing with it from that perspective and in that context, there would be much improvement for black people almost overnight. You understand? This is, this is known. This is guaranteed. This is not no what if, no maybe, no shmaybe. This is amen and amen. Um, but the Valley of the Dry Bones, the conditions that face black people in America by Rudolph R. Windsor, is a fascinating compilation of history, anthropology, sociology, and theology. In clear, limpid prose, Windsor tells the history of the black people from biblical times until today, drawing extensively upon the Bible and many works by eminent scholars in various disciplines, the author has created a work that is at once inspiring and intriguing. He seeks to prove that the black people, more properly called black Israelites, quote, end quote, are truly God's chosen people and as such should become more aware of their unique heritage, what we call our divine heritage. The Valley of the Dry Bones represents a first step in this admirable endeavor. In the latter half of the book, Windsor moves from biblical times to the present. Not only does he delineate the problems blacks face, but he also offers some solutions. Together with the lucid text are illustrations that are both timely and relevant. Windsor, in addition to knowing his history, has a wealth of common sense that he shares with his readers. No dusty volume of willingly forgotten data. The Valley of the Dry Bones is a controversial and daring volume. That rare work of scholarship, a book that makes the lessons of history pertinent to the modern reader. The Valley of the Dry Bones offers its reader a glimpse into a field of research that indeed merits a greater a great deal of attention and careful thought. Brothers and sisters, once again, um, I think we have this as a free download, but check out our studies page. And many of these documents one can download to their mobile device, their computer, iPod, or whatever. And from there can, you know, check it out for themselves. What we're going to focus on right here is how the niggers got to America. You understand, for this black history, this, this first um, black history uh, month um, 
first of a, hopefully a series. It says right here, verse 68, and the Lord, and the Lord, you understand, but really, and Yahweh, shall bring thee into Egypt again, shall bring us into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake to thee, thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold to your enemies for bond men and bond woman, and no man shall buy you. Now, you can see the picture of that right there. We came into what? Egypt again. Now, how is it, some will say, how is it that we come into Egypt again? America, not Egypt. Egypt is over there. This is America. You know what this is, right? Y'all know what this is. This is, a, this is a dollar bill. Dollar bill, y'all. You understand? And I'm sure by now, I know many of y'all should know this by now, but some might not. You see what that image is. Like Christ asks them, whose inscription? Whose inscription is on this? And they said, it's Caesar's. Whose inscription is on this? It looks like Egypt's. This is Egypt's inscription. You understand? And that right there is what the Lord was speaking of in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 68. You understand? Ye shall come into what? Egypt again. You know? That's, that's where we're at. You understand? You know where we're at. You know what I mean? You should, you should well, well, well. You understand? Know where you're at. So Jah shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. And then it says that we shall be sold to our enemies. Well, I mean, isn't that a part of Black History Month? We were sold. You understand? And no man shall buy you. What, what, that's what's interesting. That we were sold, but we wasn't sold for our real value. Because some people argue on that. Well, how are they going to say we were sold to our enemies and nobody bought us? You understand? Because our enemies, you can interpret it on nothing. You understand? Or if the if the force of it is on the verb, then it's quite easily interpreted that that though they 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 exchanged us, they did not pay our real value. You know, but if you think this is your real value, you know what I mean, then basically you say you're nothing. You know, if you think a dollar bill represents your real value, but this is what the world wants you to believe. Because they they discovered something. That if they could hoodwink and bamboozle Black folks, you understand, they could do it to the lost sheep of the Bay to Israel. The devil thought, I'll do it to everybody. And that's where we're at right now. But everybody ain't going for it like the lost sheep went for it and still go for it. You know, that's the major difference. That's why 2012 is a very, we live in very interesting times, or as the Bible says, we live in perilous times. So, you know what this is. You should know where we're at. And this is the, this now, verse 68, you understand, for what bond men and bond women? We were sold for bond men and bond women. So all those pictures, all those drawings, all those, those uh, roots and all those movies and everything. I, I think we, nobody really doubts the fact that niggas, black folks, African American, whatever, kind of descriptor or name they want to call themselves or others or whatever. You understand? The people we're speaking about, God's people, Jah's people, you understand, were sold into slavery in the Americas. We all know that this place is a spiritual Egypt. You understand? Therefore, if the only people we can see in history fulfilling this is black people, that also means that so-called black people, niggers, negroes, niggers, you understand, are John's people, are God's people. And that means that we're the true lost sheep of the house of Israel, we Ethiopian Hebrews. And that is a powerful message and teaching for Black History Month because it, it forces us to reevaluate, you understand, everything that we've been told. Some of it is still correct, some of the things that we were told, but we'll find out that much more or perhaps as much or more was incorrect. 
and we can finally learn one thing. And one thing that's very important is to know the truth. Because the truth is what frees us. You know, everybody talks about freedom, freedom, freedom. This person, they need to know the truth. That's what needs, I mean, the truth. But see, when Jah says, and when Jah-shua says, Jesus Christos, our black Lord and Savior, says, you shall know the truth. You shall know the truth about our black Lord and Savior. You shall know the truth about Jah's people. And see, those are the main true isms that must be known. You understand? So when we talk about Black History Month, the whole year should be black history. You understand? Every day, not just for black people either, but firstly and foremostly for black folks. But every other people need to know that. You see, that's the real solution for these troubled times. But only a remnant still. It says only a remnant, and perhaps there will be more. We cannot really tell. We cannot really judge. We cannot really say so, you know, concerning whether people will receive it or not. But what we're going to do is we're going to pause for the cause right here, you know, and um, ask you to read and study verses 15 to verse 68, you know, and see if you can see niggas. See if you see niggas, like that movie. I see niggas, you know, when you're reading Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 60. Verses 15 to verse 68, special emphasis on verse 68. So now that you know, let me put this up here. You understand? This is what it's about, right? Black History Month. Yes, one love. 